Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. I'm Dan, alongside Matt as always, and we are here on day two of the NHL Entry Draft. Lots to talk about so far and looking ahead to free agency next week. Uh, Matt, why don't we just jump into it, shall we? Yep, that sounds like a plan. Going chronologically this week, uh, the expansion draft was uh, on the 21st, and we knew the Flames were going to lose somebody, and... You've been saying it for a while that they'd probably lose him. I, I guess, thought maybe there was other choices, but I think in my heart I knew our captain was going to be gone, and it's happened. Marge Giordano went to the Seattle Kraken. Uh, the Calgary Flames lose him as their expansion draft choice, so now we're short of defensemen. We've talked a lot about this. Probably, I would imagine, not a lot of thoughts at this point that haven't been covered, but anything uh, that you want to say about this pick? Well, it it's one of those situations where... Is it disappointing? Yes. The Flames did need to lose somebody. And unfortunately, it was the team's captain. But realistically, with the $6.5 million freed up from the cap hit, you know, we're going to be seeing the Flames reinvest that in somebody else. So, you know, and you're realistically going to be seeing them... St- sign a player that's in the 28 to 30 year age range give or take to replace uh, what Giordano brings so you know if you look at it kind of as like a straight across type thing then you know it kind of is like a weird way of looking at making a trade and like, there's a lot. There's a lot of discussion on our on our Facebook page about this, and sort of you know what you're talking about is do we get rid of him? Do we get rid of somebody else? Who do we get rid of there? And a few people said they they personally didn't like Tanev as a player or didn't think he was the right guy. But Matt, tell me if you think this as well. And and I was talking to some of our fans on the Facebook page. This was the right asset to leave unprotected. Whether you like Tanev or not, he's a 31-year-old defenseman. There's value to that asset. If you want to move Tanev, you can get value. For a 38-year-old defenseman, as much as we might love him or he might be a great captain, that was, from an asset management perspective, the right guy for them to leave unprotected. Yeah, well, you look at this past season, uh, Mark Giordano, it took him a long time to look like the Mark Giordano that we're used to. And, like, you can't have... Like, it, it taking him, like, half of the season next year to play at a top four level. Like, he was fairly bad for a good, like, three months last year. Like, it, it wasn't until, like, April, practically, that he started to play like himself. And he's only going, you know, he is going to be 39. And, you know, is, is he going to even be playing at a top four defense level uh, by the time this season comes up and you know with that being up in the air uh, like yeah we have you know of course like with the Norris season only being a couple years ago like you have that memory fresh in your mind but you know this is a d- player that is going to be depreciating in value like over the next couple of years and like last year he played more at like a four million dollar defenseman level and that's only going to get worse and so the flames did free up six and a half million dollars which they can spend Mm -hmm. on a guy that's a six and a half million dollar player now and moving forward and we'll talk a bit later about how we might fill geo's absence but I think it's, you know, it's like when Jerome left. We're, we're all kind of sad as Flames fans. We like the player. We like what he's done as captain. But in this case, it was the right move asset management-wise. Yeah, like, I don't really envision, like, if the Flames would have went and, like, protected Giordano as well, then you're losing one of Backlund, Dubé, or Mangiapane. And, like, at that point, like, that's well, just... Well, they, they, they could have just protected him and exposed another defenseman like Tanev. I think that's the way you would have done it. Yeah, like it, it and even then like Tanev played significantly better in my opinion than Giordano did last season. So yeah, it's one of those it it sucks, but you know, it was easily the right move. 
And the team has talked about making a culture shift, um, you know, in the dressing room this off season. I think this is a good way to start that culture shift, moving out the longest serving piece and saying, you know, what, we're going to do things differently. And I think this is a low impact piece Brad can do. Our GM, Brad for living, it doesn't take, you know, it's not giving up assets. It's it's kind of moving out a guy who, like you said, is probably depreciating. Even if we like him as Flames fans, if we look at it objectively. And I've talked to some people from other organizations about our captain. He's an older asset. He's probably still valuable, but not at that price. And it's probably the right time to move on from him and, and you know, chart a new course. Yeah, and realistically, like, the Flames are going to have a large amount of dollars to spend in free agency or via trade this year. And, that's and, and and they only have, realistically, three spots on the team that they need to address. A top four defenseman and two forwards well, that can play in the top nine. Well, let's talk in a little bit. No, I know. But, uh, y- you know, so, like, it's one of those, like, the f- Flames are in a good spot to be able to ad- quickly address the things that they need without, you know, like, having to go out and spend a huge amount of like draft pick or young player assets to go get them. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, and I, I don't want to use this analogy because it's, um, I don't know, it's kind of morbid, but this was something I saw on Twitter and I thought it was kind of apt. When, you know, sometimes when your parent or grandparent passed away, they leave you a windfall, some sort of inheritance. They said that our captain is leaving. It's sort of like your grandpa passing away and leaving you money. Our captain's leaving, and it frees up, like you said, a whole bunch of cap space. So as much as your sad grandpa's passed or mom's passed, you get this, you know, windfall of money. That's kind of the same thing here. We're happy that we're happy that we're getting the the cap room to do something, but we're sad to see our captain leave. Exactly, and it's you know, like nobody, I think, at all is happy that this was how the Mark Giordano era ended. But, you know, it, there are positives, and the team just has to move carry forward. on and move forward. I'm trying to find, if I find it here, who said that on Twitter about the inheritance thing, I'll credit them. I'm, I'm scrolling through as we're recording. But uh, let's talk about what came out of that expansion draft as well, which is the Calgary Flames acquiring a player. Uh, the Calgary Flames made the first ever trade with the Seattle Kraken, so we can go in the uh, history books for that. The Calgary Flames acquired forward Tyler Pitlick, who was freshly taken by Seattle, for next year's 2022 fourth-round draft pick. So the Calgary Flames brought on a forward, uh, Tyler Pitlick, for those that don't know him, originally drafted by the Oilers in the second round, number 31 of the 2010 draft. He played for the Oilers for two NHL seasons, played for their AHL affiliates in both Oklahoma and Bakersfield. Um, actually three seasons and then he's played for Dallas, Philadelphia and Arizona since Arizona last year Uh, this guy is a he's listed as a center he can also play I think some right wing he is um, 6 foot 2 or yeah 6 foot 2 200 pounds so a bigger guy right shot which we need I think this is for the price given up I think there's a good acquisition what do you think of Pitlick? yeah uh, the way I look at it with the signing of Brett Ritchie and the acquisition of uh, Lance Pitlick, or Tyler Pitlick. Tyler Pitlick. Yeah, Lance was his father. Um, anyhow, uh, and then having... We just got Mo- rid of an old player. We're not bringing in some guy's dad. Yeah, uh, and then uh, Milan Lucic, I think you have the fourth line right there. And I think uh, each of those guys bring some size, defensive responsibility, and can hit and generate energy and i think that's what you know sutter's brand of hockey is like if you look at the kings back when he was coaching there like they had jordan nolan and andreoff and you know just those bigger physical guys that you you send out there to liven the game up a bit yeah, no, I, I think you're you're totally right. That'll be his role on the team is um, is being an energy guy or even a, I guess, yeah, more you're checking forward. If we look at his stats in the past, um, that's really what he does. I mean, last year he played in 38 games. He had six goals, five assists for 11 total points, 16 penalty minutes, but he is your checker, right? Dallas, he had 34 penalty minutes, so he's not a guy who's taking bad penalties. I think um, you mentioned him on your fourth line. I could see him... 
slotting into the third line, like the Lucic backland line, if they continue that when they need him to. But I think this is your replacement for Derek Ryan as your fourth line center. I agree. As soon as I heard that that was what the Flames did, I'm like, oh, well, that's Derek Ryan's moving on right there. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, it's one of those situations where because the Flames, as, as if you – slot Pitlick uh, as the fourth line center, the Flames now need two top nine forwards and to like fill out the roster and I think that with the amount of cap space that they have available that should be an easily doable thing where you could, I agree. could get those and keep Pitlick on your fourth line instead of having to have him play up on the third so it's a good thing, and hopefully the Flames can continue to move some things around to get all of the parts that they need. Pitlick's 29, and he's making $1.75 million. So, I mean, you and I both like Ryan. I've always said I thought Ryan was maybe making a little bit more than he should for his role, but I think one point seven five for a veteran guy like Pitlick, that doesn't feel too bad. It's one year left in the deal, so... Uh, he's a UFA after that. I don't know if he would have ever earned more than that in a flat cap era, but I think this is a guy I could see. He's a Daryl Sutter type player, and I could see Daryl wanting to bring him back again at a slightly re- reduced number. Um, but yeah, I, I can see this guy being around for a little bit. Yeah, and it's sort of like uh, Brett Ritchie and how he played last year for the Flames. It, a prototypical Daryl Sutter forward made all the sense in the world to bring him back he'll play great on the fourth line and just keep doing that kind of thing and we'll see it'll be interesting to see how this team will be composed uh after uh the start of free agency do you do you see any scenario here where pitlick uh starts season in stockton uh, things would have to go weird, I think, like where, like, say, Connor Zari unexpectedly makes the NHL and pushes people down the lineup, and I just uh, for, do not see any scenario where that happens. Me neither, and I think because you could slot him in on the wing, too, I think he's versatile enough, even as your 13th forward, I think he stays here. Like, Brett yeah. Ritchie was kind of surprised that we sent him to Stockton last year, I think for some people, and it's... Um, but I think Pitlick is, he's shown that he's an NHLer, and at that salary, you keep him as an NHLer. Yeah, exactly. So giving up a fourth round pick for that, Matt, seemed like a, a fair return to you. I think it's a, I think it's a totally fair return. What do you think? Yeah, and just like reading online the reaction from the uh, Coyotes fans, like he was one of the few players on the team that consistently showed that he cared at times on the ice where you know when you're playing for a team like Arizona it's hard to be dialed in so it's interesting to see that the Flames managed to get somebody who seems to actually be more of a team guy instead of and if we're trying to change our culture here that's what we're looking for exactly so I think I, I really like this trade. I didn't know a lot about Pitlick, but the more I've researched him and talked to people around the league who have seen him play or played in their cities, um, the the more I've you know learned about him, the the happier I am that we got him. I think he's going to be a great depth piece there. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, that brings us to the entry draft. Yesterday, July 23rd, my birthday, was the first round of the entry draft, and today is the second round, and the Flames have made their second pick. So let's talk about the first two picks the Flames made. Didn't make any movement in the first. Last year, we saw them trade down twice. Um, other years, we've seen them trade right out of the first round, but this year, they made the pick as expected at number 12, and they took a guy that you and I didn't profile um, in the past, and that was Matthew Coronado. He's playing in the USHL. Um, for Chicago Steel, committed to going to Harvard. So he's a Harvard man. Um, he'll be probably, uh, I would imagine, end up playing all four years there. He's been ranked as high as 11 by some of the scouting lists, as low as 32. 18 year old from Greenlaw, New York. He's a, a left, listed as a left winger, but he shoots right. He's played a lot of center. Um, and the 
sort of the uh, profile of him from elite prospects is his hands form the foundation of his offensive profile. He wants to have the puck on his stick and isn't afraid to court contact to make sure he's the one driving the bus for his line. He's decisive, manipulative, and dexterous as a handler. He's got a good shot for someone who's constantly throwing pucks on net. His release is fast, and he's versatile in how he gets his pucks on his pucks off. Matt, what do you like about Coronado? Uh, well, I'll start actually with what I don't like about him, and it's a minor thing. His skating is not efficient, and um, he, a little wonky, basically. Neither's mine. That's why I didn't go in the first round. Exactly. And, you know, it, it's one of those uh, it's fixable. Like, he's not the fastest guy, but he's not slow either, and his skating stride is just off and not very good. And, like, I remember uh, back when Gustav Nyquist was drafted by Detroit, and he fell in the draft for similar reasons, but he during his stay in the NCAA, he was able to address that and actually has become one of the f- more quick-paced players uh, in recent times. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see if Coronado can fix that little hitch in his uh, skating stride. But it, again, like that, you're. It's not like his top end speed is slow. It's just everything, like his acceleration's not where it needs to be, and the pivoting is not at where it needs to be. But, and you and I have seen at the rookie camps in the past that the Flames actually bring in power skating coaches and stuff, so I think that's something they could coach him on. Yeah, exactly. It's like the tools are there, it's just the how to use them hasn't been efficiently applied, and that that's an easy fix, whereas like if he's just slow, period, and like all the mechanics are right, that's more of a difficult thing, so... In the scheme of things, like, that's the most minor thing. It basically, though, it, he is as good of a scorer as you, is available in this draft. I, I actually think he has the best shooting ability of anybody in this draft. And he's a right winger, which, you know, since Joe McGinley left, the flame, like, that's basically, since we've been recording, like, that's been, like, we need a right shooting right winger. Like, that's been our mantra, basically, every offseason and draft. And so Matt, we've f- got a right winger. We can shut down the recording. Turn the mic off. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. Finally, after nearly a decade, <laughs> we got Matt, do you one. Know what, do you know what Coronado's nickname is? Every good hockey player's got a nickname. Bison, I think. The Bison. And they yeah. call him that because he goes hard to the net and he rams like a bison. Um, he's... He's five foot ten, so he's not a huge guy. Um, but just some quotes here about uh, from him and from our GM that might be interesting. He says something he's proud of at in his game is the ability to play two hundred feet, yeah, two hundred foot game. And he says, "quote I think I'm competitive in all three zones and contribute in all three zones. I think my work ethic might be my biggest asset." End quote. And we we saw that same uh, sentiment echoed by our GM. Uh, Brad Treliving, who said, quote, This guy is unique in his ability to score. To us, you add a goal scorer with a motor, a hungry player, really intelligent. He's not a perimeter guy or a guy who cheats to score. He's a well-rounded player, which is unique for someone with his finishing skill. There's a lot of background homework. It kept coming up how popular of a teammate he was. It's not just a popularity contest. He leads by the way he is in the gym. He's a rink rat. He's there first. He stays late, end quote. So, Brad Treliving echoing some of what you were saying, right? That guy who's working hard, um, you know, he's always there. And that's what you want. We're talking about the team guy with Pitlick, this is another team guy. Yeah, and if you look at the Flames' last uh, three first-round picks, like, that seems like a good line in the NHL, that very complementary skill sets to one another with uh, Jacob Peltier, Connor Zari, and now uh, Matthew Coronado. And... Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Like, uh, I would not be shocked if that ended up being a line at some point because of just the makeup of each of the players. I think the biggest thing for Flames fans to remember on this pick is he is NCAA bound, so he's off to Harvard. And just like some of our first round picks in the past who are going the college route, like Mark Jankowski, there's going to be a bit of a waiting game here. I don't see the Flames trying to rush him pro or turn him pro before he's done at Harvard. We have enough 
forward pieces, I think they can fill out a lineup, you know, from there. So this might not be a guy that you see even in, you know, playing in Stockton for at least four years. Yeah, if you look at, like, um, with uh, Montreal this past year uh, with Cole Caulfield, I think that's more or less what you're looking at is that same situation where he played two years and then in the third year uh, won the Hobie Baker and all that and then signed into the NHL. And I think that with the makeup of the player, I think you're going to see it pretty much that exact profile where he's going to be a dominant player for Harvard for the first two years and then into the third year uh, you, you'll you'll likely see him signed and into the NHL um, if if like all of the things progress at like this natural flow like what happened with Caulfield because that to my mind is a good comparable of the type of player uh, between the two of them that, you know, similar makeup and all of that, so we'll Yeah, see. I can see that. Um, but yeah, not, I think a guy that Flames fans are going to have to wait on, and I think some fans from what I saw online last night when the pick was made have a little bit of a bad taste in their mouth because the last time we made a high pick from a guy bound for Harvard, it was Adam Fox, who we know didn't want to play here. Obviously made that uh, work for us in the end, dealing him as part of the lindholm Hannafin deal. Um, but I, I don't think that you can paint this guy with the same brush just because he's also going to Harvard. I see no reason why Matthew Coronado wouldn't want to come play in Calgary. And even said, I mean, obviously you say it to the draft, but said he's he's excited to uh, join the Flames. How would you say Adam Fox had an attitude problem right from the get-go, and it was quite clear even like when we first spoke to him that like yeah this is not a player that's ever going to suit up for the Calgary Flames, and it, it it's it, with Coronado it's not you do not see the same bad attitude, frankly, and I I think that's the main reason why Fox fell to the third round was. Like everybody kind of knew that he, the New York Rangers were going to get him eventually, and the Flames just managed to capitalize on some value uh, there and utilize him as a good trade piece. And the Calgary Flames have now made their second pick, the 45th overall pick in this draft. And they, with that pick, they took another forward, William Stromgren. He's a Swedish player, 18 years old, six foot three, 176 pounds, left shot, listed as a left winger. He's been rated everywhere from 35th in this draft all the way down to 54th. And according to uh, Elite Prospects, Stromgren is a winger with fast and powerful skating. Along with his great puck handling skills, he can find creative solutions carrying the puck down the ice maneuvering through the defense. He's more of a shooter rather than a playmaker with a quick and accurate release, but also sees the ice very well to set his teammates up. We've had a lot of success with Swedes in the past, uh, I'd say, you know, 10 years in the draft here in Calgary. What do you think of Stromgren? Well, if he actually turns out he'll be the first Swedish forward to make the NHL for the Flames since Michael Backlund. But uh, anytime you're getting a six foot three winger, who has speed and can shoot, that's a very good base to start from. And, like, everything else is teachable, and, it, you know, you can't teach offensive skill. And, it, like, his stats were kind of just adequate, but it'll be interesting to see uh, over the next couple years uh, how he performs in uh, the Swedish Elite League. And, you know, it. We'll see. Um, it, one of those where like all of the tools are there, and he's just raw. And he, the one thing that uh, it's notable is that the Flames, over the last handful of years, have been identifying that they need to be quicker on the ice. And like you're seeing, like Peltier was a a quicker player. Zari was a quicker player. Uh, Coronado, even though his skating stride and th mechanics are off, he's quick for, despite that. And then you've got uh, Stromgren here that is uh, very much in the same mold of being a quick-paced player. And I think that that will, you know, and he's six foot three, so like that will help uh, as we're we're moving on. 
Um, hopefully it just, uh, like some of these players can actually translate into the NHL. And I think, you know, difference when you're looking at weak stats as well, a guy who's playing in a men's league, right? Very different than playing in the U- USHL or the WHL. So he's playing over in Sweden. You were saying sort of the AHL of the Swedish league, but still playing in a men's league where um, I-, I think it's harder often for the 18, 19 year olds to put up really good numbers over there. Yeah. Um, a lot of comparisons uh, would be more to like a Joel Armia type, which you know, if uh, Stromgren turns into that solid like second, third line uh, depth guy who can be a good two way player and chip in a little bit, like that would be perfect for that level of pick. For sure. So uh, I also like before we move on from this guy, I I really like that he's six foot three. I think we need not only more, like you said, we not only need to get quicker. I think we need to get bigger as a team. And I think a six foot three player on our you know our top our top twelve down the road is going to be good for this team. We have a lot of smaller guys, and I like I just like the fact that he's that big. Yeah. Well, Matt, that brings us to the main event, and you started talking about this earlier, free agency. It's the 24th of July as we record. Free agency opens on the 28th, which means that uh, we got four days to figure out what's going to go on. But let's talk a little bit here. Um, I'll I'll walk us through some different questions to set the stage here. But let's talk about, I think, the most exciting time for hockey fans uh, in a lot of ways, which is free agency. So let's first start by talking about who's not uh, signed by the Flames and who we think they should bring back. Does that work for you? Yep. So on the forward side, here's the guys that are not currently signed. I'll go through each one of them, and you tell me, and I'll do the same if you'd bring them back or not. Buddy Robinson. Sure-ish. Like it, yeah. it, one of those that he's perfectly fine as a Stockton leader type guy. Well, that's it. You, you need Stockton vets. He's 29. I think this might be the last year you could maybe get away with signing him as an AHL player if he's going into his 29-year-old season. Mm-hmm. But uh, he he does well in Stockton, and he's, also, he's always done well when we've called him up in an emergency, and you need those guys too. Yeah, exactly. And as long as he's adequate as the fill-in guy every once in a while, and he has been, I don't see any reason not to. But, uh, again, if the Flames decide to move on, are you going to miss that player? Not really. And there's a number of Buddy Robinson type players as UFA. I mean, if he just says, I want to change the scenery, we can find a new Buddy Robinson. Oh, yeah. Two seconds. Like, there's always a list of guys who are always wanting to sign to get spots. Even like a guy like Brett Ritchie. Mm-hmm. You know. So, not, not a big deal one way or the other, but wouldn't mind having them back. Josh Levo. Uh, no. Let him go. We, I, I expected big things from him last year, as you know, and he, to me, didn't deliver, and I don't think you'll see the Flames re-sign him. I think he could struggle to get an NHL position this year. Yeah, I think he's going to be a PTO and have to earn it. And he may be a guy that uh, ends up as somebody sort of Stockton vet or like AHL vet, and I could see him sort of take the Buddy Robinson role if he would sign that deal to be your sort of AHL vet, that recovery project. Yeah, I just don't see it being here, but I do no, agree, I agree with you. And, and, you know, for a veteran guy, maybe that's the kind of guy Seattle wants to bring in just to stock their farm team. Yeah, definitely could uh, see that. Derek Ryan. I uh, would like to have him back, but there's not really any room or necessity to. Uh, I, I like Derek Ryan. He did good enough for what he was tasked to. Always was a good complimentary piece. And, you know, any other team would be good to have him. Um, If he doesn't sign here, uh, he will have a spot in the NHL. He was good enough. Um, I I don't see him getting paid what he did. I think you're going to see him on a sub $2 million contract wherever he goes, whether it's here or elsewhere. Uh, But, yeah, I'd definitely have him back if the dollar is worked out. I think Pitlick being brought in is the writing on the wall that it's not going to work out here um he's 34 as well so i don't think you see him sign for more than a year yeah but i think ryan will get an nhl job i just don't know like you said it's got to be sub two million um and i just i don't know that 
I, I like him. He's a good guy. He's good in the room, but I'm not sure you bring him back. If you're trying to make a cultural shift here, I think you've got to just purge some of those guys that were here and almost make change for the sake of change. Yeah, I can agree with that. So I think I can totally see him ended up in Seattle. I can see him ended up um, a lot of places. I think he'll be in the NHL. I just don't think he yeah. comes back to Calgary. No, and realistically, like anybody who's needing a service a little fourth line center, which okay, that's thirty two teams <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. So he will get a job. It's just where and how. But uh, yeah, it, literally every team could use a Derek Ryan. Those are our three UFAs on the forward side. Now let's get to our two RFAs. The next one, obviously, is a re-sign, and that's 23-year-old Dylan Dubé. Yeah, and I see him being around a $2 million contract, give or take. I think Dubé struggled a little bit more than some people expected him to, so I think he's going to have to take a little bit of a money hit because of that. But yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I don't want to see more than 2 and a half for him on this next deal. I think... Two million is where you where you want to be. You know, one eight to kind of two point two would be where I'd be looking to sign him. Yeah, and for a third line player, he was perfectly good. And at that that price range for a re-sign, that's perfectly adequate. Uh, and that's it. If you're signing him as a third liner, that's an adequate price. Yeah, and realistically, like with how the team's made up, having him learn from Michael Backlund is not the worst thing in the world so no. and especially because of like his particular skill set he's more of a two-way forward anyway and so him learning how to play excellent defensively at the nhl level i think will benefit him in the long term especially if he can translate that offensive game as well yeah i agree and i think this is sort of his I guess transitional contract. It's kind of that you know what we're going to pay you a little bit less than maybe you think you're worth, or maybe your your uh, your upside dictates. Show us you've earned more, and I can see it being like a two year deal. And like you said, put him with Backlund and say, show us you can you can earn more than that. Yeah, and realistically, taking it slow with Dubé and allowing him to develop properly with a guy like Michael Backlund, I think will benefit both him and the team in the long term and i think that you're if that's the case you're going to end up getting a better player out of dube who might end up developing into a good second line forward like two or three years down the line instead of you know just a good complimentary piece I think Dubé's at a spot right now where he's either he's either going to have a lot of upside and he'll become a second line guy. I don't know he'll be more than that, or he's we are seeing the top end of his potential. So I think that one eight to two two is sort of it's pain at twenty three to see where this guy tops out. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. And the next guy on the list is Glenn Godden. He's a twenty four year old center. We saw him get some NHL time this year. Another. RFA, he can play center right wing. What do you think about Godin? Yeah, and I think that he, he'll probably be either the first line guy in Stockton or like the 13th forward, 12th forward type guy up here. He's kind of getting to the point now where he's a, he's a tweener. There's not a lot for him to do at the HL level to improve his game, but I'm not sure he's quite ready, especially with a pit lick, to be... Uh, top 12 so I think this is one of those players you sign him if you're willing to make him a part of your NHL roster otherwise I think you got to move on from him but as an RFA you qualify him you sign him and I think you give him every chance to lose that 13th forward job yeah exactly and you know say well it's up to you <laughs> and let her up Let's move to the back end of the team, um, yep. I, and I, I agree with you on all those ones. On defense, uh, we've got one UFA, and that's the guy that we can't seem to get rid of, 31-year-old Michael Stone. For me, I would be bringing Stone back. I would be looking at him. I think he's shown us now he deserves to be in the NHL as much as we've you know joked about him leaving, coming back, paying him to go away, paying him to come back. I think this is your number seven. Yeah, and I think that uh, he might even be more than that, to tell you the truth. Uh it seemed that like with all of the injuries that he had i think uh, that he just needed some time off period um where he wasn't playing even though he might have been nhl able 
uh, but not needed to play, I think helped him basically reset himself and like when he came back fully last year like that was the Michael Stone that we acquired in the first place and I think that like if the Flames can keep him for like two million or less and have him as the number six or number seven I think that would be perfect I don't think you can go two million on him again I think this has got to be a Uh, sub million and a half deal yeah I'm like on the upper end saying like two million but i think like one a quarter one and a half would be more appropriate but yeah he showed enough in that little span where like i would definitely want him back yeah i i like you could see him being higher in the lineup i kind of hope not because i'm hoping we can fill out depth without him but michael stone seems like to me the kind of guy you want is your seven who can step in can play on short notice always is consistent i can't remember a bad michael stone game and i think you know every team needs that guy that can just be there and ready to go yeah i agree so you bring him back as a ufa and then our three rfas uh the next one 24 year old oliver shillington Obviously, uh, bring him re- back. Yeah, you're bring him back. Him? Yeah, and again, give him another shot. And you know, his time in as an NHL player is slowly coming to an end. Uh, if he does not take those next steps, but you have to give him the rope to actually be able to take those next steps. So. Sort of uh, like Dubé, I think you're paying here for the potential, and it's, okay, this is your contract, show us what you can do. And I think that his role could open up this year with Gio gone. I think he's almost guaranteed a top six spot. Yeah, exactly, and he needs to take the baton and run with it. Uh, the next guy, obviously, we'd re-sign. Uh, oh, so before we move on from Shillington, what do you think Shillington's deal looks like? Uh, around a million or less. Like I don't think you can le- go more than a million on him. Yeah, league minimum to a million, that ballpark. Yeah, I, I would I would like this guy to be making about eight fifty nine hundred. Yeah. Uh last year he's making eight uh actually last year's cap hit was seven thirty and I believe he was making eight sixty, so maybe you're going like eight seventy five to nine hundred on, on Shillington and probably no more than three years. Yeah. If he's 24, if you do three years, you got him until he's 27, you'll know what he is by 27. Well, frankly, I'd be surprised if it was more than a one-year deal. Like, put it up or, you know, we move on. The only reason I can see them maybe doing two or three is I think he could be a useful trade piece down the road. And having, you know, a two-year deal, you can move him at the deadline or move him as part of a package for something. And somebody's getting a good number on him. Yeah. Um, next guy, Yusuf Valamaki. What he he's twenty two. He's he's in a very weird RFA uh, class where he's technically an RFA, but he's not eligible for offer sheets from other teams. What obviously we resigned Valamaki. What does that contract look like for you? Uh, probably a one year, one and a half. And if you're adding additional years, you're adding additional dollars. One and a half feels right. I know a lot of people think that he's you know the the next big defenseman but he didn't show it he struggled last year too so I think this is again a guy who needs to show us at the NHL level what he can do I can see the team doing more than one year I can see like a three year one and a half on this guy because I think even if he doesn't make make his potential he can still be in your top seven yeah and I think as a tw- as a 22 year old on a three year deal at one and a half I don't think you'll ever regret that deal yeah, like, and this is a contract that if you ever need to get out of it, you could waive him and someone would take him. I think that like next year, you're if things work out that way, I think you're going to see Valimaki and Shillington and Stone or miscellaneous veteran guy being your five, six, seven, and um, the Flames needing to go out and address a, a top four position elsewhere. Yeah, I'm, and I've said this before, I don't know that Valimaki is going to develop to the high-end upside a lot of people think he, he could have. I think at this point with some of his injuries, I, I don't know he's going to get as high as he did, but I think I'd give him three years. Oh, for sure. Wants it. But uh, I wouldn't go more than a million and a half, like you said. Yeah. 
Um, I think like if you go three years, I think you're you're looking at more two million dollars just because of you're paying for like the third year. You know, if his the value, it, yeah, like it it's one of those. I think you're going to see a one year, maybe two, uh, on him. I, I'd be surprised if it was three or more. And I think that the Flames need to have the ability. Because it's apparent that, like, they're not going to go into, like, full teardown rebuild or retool, um, just because those deals would have happened already. Um, so, y you're not going to want to have to rely on Valimaki and Shillington being in your top four. Um, so, it, it's apparent that they're going to need to get somebody to play in that top four spot that Giordano vacated. It, so that way you can allow guys like Valenaki and Shillington time to develop on the third pairing. Good point. And the last uh, defenseman here is 24-year-old Connor Mackey. We saw him a little bit at the NHL level this year, RFA. To me, you obviously re-sign him. He's got ARB rights, but I don't think he would ARB, he'd would he get ARB for higher than the team would offer. I think you put him on a two-way. He's waiver exempt. I don't see Mackey starting in the NHL next year. Um, so I think you do like a you know seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollar deal two way and put him in Stockton. Well, put it this way: if Val Mackey play or if Mackey plays well enough that he's in the lineup, well then okay, <laughs> you know like it's not a, a but big that's deal. true of everybody, man. Right? I mean, yeah, no, and could, like he looked um, reasonably. We said that about Colton Pullman. Yeah. Well, it's one of those, he actually looked like an NHL player in his brief time in the NHL. So, like, I could see him being on the third pairing if they, if Shillington does not live up to expectations. And, like, where Mackey, if he's playing at that level, I think you could see him slot in on that spot with Mackey, Valimaki and have the announcer dread valimaki Mackey pairing. And See, and I just I think that if Mackey doesn't live up to that, the Flames always like to bring in one or two veteran guys. Your Alex, you know, Petrovic, um, Colton Pullman. Like I, th I think they would probably rather. I, I'm just, and I don't know this, but just knowing what Tree's history is, I think they would rather put Mackey in the AHL if someone doesn't live up to their potential above him on the depth chart and bring in a, a veteran defenseman to fill that spot or give it to Stone. Yeah. Oh, I can see that. It it would be how would you say with uh, Mackey it does not seem that he has very far to go to be an NHL regular and yeah. it's just uh, whether that step is like right away or after a half season or a full season in Stockton that's the question mark rather than you know and we'll see and then the last guy who's on our NHL roster, we'll talk about a couple guys not on the NHL roster after this, but the last guy on our NHL roster is our backup goaltender, Louis Domingue. He's UFA. I, I could see the Flames bringing him back if they want to give Markstrom most of the load next year, but I don't see Domingue coming back. I think they yeah. will go in a different direction for a veteran backup. Yeah, and realistically, there are a number of goalies like there are every year that will be able to slot in for like a million and a half or less that will play the 15, 20 games. And I've heard uh, some rumblings of Laurent Bossois coming back to Calgary as an organization. We were the team that drafted him. I could see that happening um, because he's used to playing behind Hellebuck. So well, let's get to who he might bring in a little bit later, but yeah, yeah I can't, I can't I, see this specific player coming back. Yeah, well, like that's just um, like the generic genre of player that you know I could envision. You know, and I don't think Deming is quite at that level. I agree. Um, so let's go through a couple names here that are not in the NHL. We won't talk about actual salary demands, but just keep them or get rid of them. Uh, UFA Zach Ronaldo. Keep him. Keep him, I agree. Um, just Dominique Simone. Uh, let him go. Let him go. He's an RFA with ARB. I don't, he didn't work out here. If you want to sign him as AHL depth, which is where he ended the year, I'd say keep him. But if you're looking at him as NHL depth, I'd say get rid of him. Yeah. Justin Kirkland. Uh, either way. Uh, I agree. Yeah. 
If they need the veteran, great. If not, okay. How about Matthew Phillips? I think you've got to re-sign Phillips. Yeah, he's going to be pushing for a spot in the lineup sooner than later. Like I think and because like, of that, I think he's a great candidate for a two-way. Right? Prove to us you can make say the million bucks at the NHL level. Otherwise, you're back to the AHL on a lower deal. Yeah, and realistically, like this, I think is the make or break year for Phillips. Like if he hasn't pushed his way into the lineup at some point, then it's like okay, you, yeah, we're not gonna be focusing too much on you as a mm-hmm. player moving forward. I agree. Um, none of the other defensemen we're talking about, really, but let's go to the goalies. Uh, both RFAs, Tyler Parsons. Yeah, just because, but uh, he's getting a little long in the tooth there. And 25-year-old Artem Zagadulin. Yeah, I'd bring him back. I'd bring those guys back. We also have Justin or Dustin Wolf turning pro this year, so I think I would probably go with a... I think there's two ways to do this. I think you either go Parsons, Zagadulin in the AHL again, and you put Wolf in Kansas to play a ton of minutes, or I'd probably go Wolf, Zagadulin in the AHL and Parsons back to the ECHL to play a ton of minutes. Yeah, I agree. I think you need Parsons needs to play, and I think that he, if you're going to recoup anything from that asset you you need him to play as many games as possible and you know he he won't be doing that if he's backing up in the AHL like he needs to play I agree so now that we know who's coming back or who we'd bring back and who's not let's talk about what the Flames need to do and let's talk not specific players yet we'll get into that in a little bit but what type or what's the role we need to fill and you've talked about a few times in this show the Flames really have a few key roles what do you think of the roles the Flames need to fill well, they already uh, uh, addressed part of that, which w- with the uh, Pitlick acquisition and the Ritchie re-signing, um, they need big guys on the fourth line that can skate and have energy and be noticeable. Like, a fourth line, to me, it can be either a shutdown defensive line um, a bunch of kids that are trying to emerge in the NHL or they need to be bringing the energy. And the Flames, they don't have anybody that's really needing to be on the fourth line for kids right now. And the defensive line, realistically, that'll be the Flames' third line with Backlund, Dubé, and whomever. Um, so... I think that uh, having a crash and bang type fourth line, especially with the makeup of the team and Daryl Sutter, I think that is a huge thing. And it'll be interesting to see um, on that aspect if the like because uh, uh, like there was talk of Blake Coleman um, going and getting him from Tampa Bay. Like if that would be another guy that would be a decent. Fitting in that same theme. Yeah, uh, let's talk names in a little bit here. But so you're yeah. thinking we just need some more players who can play more of a physical game. That's sort of what Daryl Sutter used to call the Western Canadian style. Yeah, well, you look at uh, this team for a number of years has always been a little bit on the too passive side. Um, and which, Too passive in what way? Not willing to necessarily engage in the manner that they need to in order to be successful like not willing to sacrifice the body when needing to or willing to throw those hits or to drop the gloves or do like just the little things and uh this team and i think that's part of why like how would you say it's sort of like how matthew kachuk plays where it he's into the game more and I think that, like, for a number of years, the Flames have been more of a cerebral-type team and instead of a get-stuff-done type team. And I think okay. that getting more players that fit the get-stuff-done... Like, you can have guys like Goudreau on the team and be perfectly successful as long as that's not the core identity of your team. Like, and... So- so these get stuff done guys, where do we slot them in the lineup? If we're looking to fill spots, what spots are we filling? Uh, 
well, one could be a winger for the Gaudreau line. Uh, the third line complement to Dubé and Backlund and on the fourth line. Okay, so you're thinking that winger on the uh, Dubé line or on the Gaudreau line, so you're thinking a right winger? Yeah. You're looking for a right shot guy there? Not necessarily. Hey. No, I, okay. I, I, it's one of those things. I've never really subscribed to the the thought of, oh, a right winger must absolutely be a right shot. Like it, it yeah, it it helps, but it realistically there like there's just not that many right shooters. Period. So like it, it, you're gonna have so like it's more the style of play more than anything. And okay. Uh, like so how, how would you say like the, this past season, right? Like when they've had like Brett Ritchie or m- insert like Levo or whomever, like uh, that line became very easy to defend because like if I'm the other coach, I'm looking at well you have Gaudreau and Monahan who are good, and then a borderline NHLer on as the third guy you'd be instructing your defense to focus on the two players that could actually hurt you, and if the other guy has the puck or is doing things, the amount of damage that guy can do by himself is negligible compared to what the other two can do, and it kind of, like, destroyed the effectiveness of that line, so they need somebody who can actually play at a level comparable, not necessarily as good, but... top six, bona fide top six forwards. Yeah, Sort of like how when the Flames had Yuri Hoodler. Like, Hoodler was not the best forward, but he was good enough where he could bounce off of what Goodrow and Monaghan were doing. And, like, since then, like, that line has been struggling to get somebody who could fill that role effectively. And, like, Lindholm did good, but Lindholm is good enough to be anchoring the Kachuk line instead and like since losing Lindholm like that line has been just not anywhere near as effective where if they had somebody that was of a similar not necessarily the same level of talent but a legit like second line winger I think that would be you need a proven top six winger yeah okay uh, on the back end, we've lost Mark Giordano. Now, if you look at our, our top four defense, it's Hannafin, Tanev, Valimaki, and Anderson. Do you think that we need to go out and buy another top four defenseman? Yes. And then on the back end for goalies, are you confident with bringing in somebody like Zega Doolin or Parsons as our backup, or do you think we need to go out and buy someone with some more NHL experience? Yes, we need to go buy somebody. I agree. So let's go through these now with some names, now that we kind of know what we're filling. Let's talk about the forward lines. I think there's some spots on the third, fourth line we could probably fill internally with guys like Godden and stuff like that. So let's focus on that top, what you were saying, that top six winger. Um, Who do you like and how much do you think it would cost to bring in a certain guy? Give us a name at a top six wing position. Well, you know... Going absurd, you know, Alexander Ovechkin hasn't signed with the Capitals, but, you know, and we could technically afford that, but... Uh, Let's go with guys that are realistic to come here. Yeah. Um, I will I will see your Ovechkin, and I will uh, I will raise you a Luke Glendening. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, so so outside of Ovi, I mean, outside, there's guys here that are obviously going to sign. Yeah, like right? a so guy like... Sam uh, Reinhardt just got traded and will sign, but who do you think realistically we could see in that top six position? Well, a guy like David Krejci might work. Um, How much would you give Krejci? Uh, I think with any of these players, you're looking at a five to six million dollar cap hit for okay. an adequate player to play with Gaudreau and Monaghan. So Dave Krejci, he is my only worry with Krejci. He's 35, so I yeah. think if you're going to bring him in, it's on a one year, and I'm not sure that's the guy we want to rely on there. I'm I'm not opposed to the to Krejci. But I, I don't know that that's the way I want to go if we're trying to build a, a core to last us a couple of years. Yeah, well, it's one of those that, um, like, especially because this particular uh, free agent crop is kind of on the weaker side. Um, 
if you went that route, you would basically be getting the effective player and punting the need for that to down a year uh, yeah. and, and reevaluate the team. Because, like, if certain players, like, say, Monaghan doesn't bounce back, like, the, the organization is in a completely different spot than, you know, if, say, he does and Krejci plays well and then, you know, then you're looking to backfill on that aspect. Krejci's coming off a seven point two five million dollar deal. What do you give him to come to Calgary at thirty five? Probably a, a one year uh, five and a half or two year six. I was going to say probably one year five. So I think five five and a half would work. Yeah. Let me throw some names out there for you, Matt. Um, yeah. I'm looking at right shot players because I think I I know what you're saying about the Flames not needing necessarily right shots in the right wing, but we've heard Tre Living talk about wanting right shots. Yeah. And we've heard the coach talk about right shots, so I think they're going to target that. So let's throw some names out there. Um, some maybe older ones like Krejci and some not as old ones. What would you think about Ryan Getzlaff as a top six forward? Uh, not really. I think he's I'm, a little past his prime. If the Flames got him cheap, uh, it, it, it would be sort of like uh, Montreal getting Corey Perry or Toronto getting Joe Thornton or Jason Spezza. It's like, yeah, okay. It, but it would be a depth guy, not uh, relying on that player to be more than that. And I think there's going to be a lot of players wanting his service. I think they'll probably bid him up more than he's worth. Yeah, like if the Flames were targeting him for the third line to complement Backlund and Dubé, sure, that would make a little bit more sense. For Monaghan's line, no. What about uh, Yoel Armia? Same thing, exactly. Um, uh, I think you would could bring like Yoel Armia in as a second line right wing. I, I would actually, that would was actually one of the players I was going to mention specifically for the Backlund line. Okay. So, so um, I would uh, be targeting him for that spot specifically. He made two six last year, and he's twenty eight years old. What do you give him for a contract? I'd go uh, three or four years at like about the same, plus maybe a bit, like say three at, at most. I, I wouldn't go more than three for this player. Yeah, it would be like a three three at at most. Rumors have the Flames talking to Zach Hyman. Is that a player you'd want to bring in? Yeah, sure. Uh, what would you pay? What would uh, you pay Hyman? About five million dollars. It, it looks like he's going to sign with the Oilers, and yeah, th that would be an adequate contract. Uh, it, it, how would you say that would be an underwhelming player for the Gaudreau line, but he would be effective enough where it it would work. Um, if you were looking to go older, sort of like you were saying with Krejci, would you look at a potential top six winger being Tyler Bozak? Possibly. 30, 35, coming off a five-year deal. I think you could probably get him sub $4 million if you needed to. And I think if you're just looking to kick that can down the road, I think Bozak might be a guy that could help you with that. Yeah. Um, it, it wouldn't... Be it, again, that wouldn't be a bad player. I I would be more uh, leaning towards him being a good player on the back one line, and like that would him and Army. So when would you say the back one line, you're thinking that then is a third line addition. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And again, so like we're, for, so if we're looking for a top two right winger, then that's not going to fill that spot. All three of the top three lines should be effective two way lines, and or at least enough able to generate some offense and like if you have um Dubé with Backland they need to have somebody who's at least equivalently competent offensively and like guys like Armia and Bozak like they fit that ability to play offensively like uh, um Bozak was on pace for about 30 points last year. Um, and the year before, he had 29. So, like, you know, and you're looking at Backland, he's probably going to be a 35 point ish guy. Dubé is going to be about a 35 ish point guy. So, you know, like, that would be a good setup for a third line. But I think that for the Gaudreau line, you need a little bit more 
on the offensive so side. So are of you it. looking at the Gaudreau line? Let, let's use numbers here because not everyone knows where these players are. The Gaudreau line, are you looking at that as line one or line two? Because last year that was line two a lot. I would be leaning more line two on that one. Okay. So I'll throw one more name for the third line, what you're calling the backland line, um, and then let's fill out that to- those top wing positions because that's what we need. I think if you're looking to fill a, a third line spot and you're looking for somebody a little bit younger, I'd look at Kyle Palmieri. 30 years old, coming off a $4.6 million deal. If you could get him sub four, I think that's a guy that could be your uh, second slash third line winger. Yeah. So, Matt, you're saying we need a top six winger, and I agree. None of these guys, it sounds like, fit that spot for you. Who do you bring in to play on uh, either the top two lines? So, the let's call it the lindholm Kachuk line or the goudreau Monahan line, our top two lines. Who do you put on the right side of those? Well, on the UFA front, like, Krejci was, you know, unless they somehow, like, Ovechkin wanted to leave Washington, which I doubt, and for some reason wanted to come here, then sure, but uh, Krejci would be a good fit. Or, you know, looking at any team who's in cap trouble, and which there are a lot, and say taking one of those decent middle six guys that has offensive skill, and, like, the guy basically needs to be an equivalent of what Hoodler was back when we got him. Uh, just a decent, like, can put up 40, 50 points and not be bad, basically. So so who would that guy be? Well... You're the GM, you got to shop. You can't shop for a fictitious set of stats. What's the name of the player you bring in there? Hmm. Or look to bring in? Like, this year it's tough, I think. Yeah, that that's the main problem, is that it, it is really tough because, um, you know, like... It just because everything is in such flux with pretty much all of the teams that it's hard to say specifically. Oh, go get this one guy. It, it in this particular case, like that's why I'm using more of the archetype of the decently uh, skilled. You know what I mean? Because like it, mm-hmm. it's hard or. Just because, like, everybody's kind of up and down right now. So let me let me throw some names out there and tell me what you think of these. How about that? Yeah, sure. I think because we need a right winger, and I don't see a lot of good proven top six that are going to be available at a reasonable price. And I'm going to so when I say right winger, I'm going to say right shot, just because I think the the Flames want right shots. I mean, we just talked about some of the right shots. I don't think you see a lot of them there. I think. Paul Mary is probably the best of that group that's not aging. I think um, Sam Reinhart would have been the right guy to target there, but he just got traded and will likely get signed. So let's throw this idea out there. Lindholm can play either one. What if that first line is Kachuk on the left, Lindholm on the right, because I think it'll be easier to fill that center spot, and a guy like uh, Krejci or a guy like... Um, let's look at this list. A guy like Krejci or... Derek Stepan or uh, David Backus or Travis Zajac down the middle there? Uh, well, realistically, like, other than Zajac, like, all those guys, and Krejci, like, the other two guys are kind of not really NHLers at this point. Um, so okay, it's... so then go with, what if you were to then go down the middle with, like, who would, I, I guess we just need to find out who's going to be on that line. So what if you go with um, looking at center's, like it, it, okay, what if you go Alex? I guess he's not really there either. You're not going to get Landis Cog. I'm just looking at the list. Okay, yeah. so let's do let's do this. What if your uh, second line right winger was Thomas Tatar? That would be okay ish. Thomas Tatar, I, I think he's a guy that with the right line mates, and if he was with say Johnny and Monty, I think you might be able to get more out of him. Yeah. Um, what if you were to go Artem Anisimov? Yeah, you're kind of dumpster diving at that point. Um, like it, it's a tough free agent class. Is what I'm trying to figure out is who can we get and who can we like, bring yeah, in? If you're wanting to say move Land, uh, Lindholm to the right wing, I think that the only way that you could realistically do that would be to sign uh, Landis Cog. 
and have him being the center on that line and then moving Manjapane down to the second line wing with Gaudreau. But do you think Lannis Cog wants to... Like, I think he's going to get bit up so much he's not going to be competitive price-wise. No, uh, but... the fl- it, How would you say... Um, if the Flames... Like, I'm looking at him being a $7 million-ish dollar player. Um, okay. And the Flames do have about 15 ish million to play with. So if you were to go that route, you could cheapen out on the third line winger and uh, invest, you know, basically like $4 million on the that defenseman and like a million-ish on the goaltender and be adequate under the cap. It It is doable. It's just you'd have to scale it, back the level of player that you'd get for the other guys. That's all. If we if we could bring in Landis Cog at 7 million, he's 28 and no like not doing a weird, you know, 6 7 year deal to to lessen the AAV. If we could do like I'd say 3 or 4 years 7 million, I'd be okay with that, but I don't see Landis Cog landing here. No. Um and, and this is a year like I guess I'm bringing up these names Line A is not going to land here. There's your other big name. Um, I, I look at this as a year that you can't solve the issue forever. I think you can bring in a guy like um, even a you know a, a David Krejci, like you were saying, um, guys that I think just will will fill the role for a year. Otherwise, I think those top six positions are going to have to be good enough, like a Joel Armia, or you're going to have to trade into them. Yeah, and. Realistically, the Flames could uh, make trades to get, you know, because there are teams that are going to be struggling mighty to shed cap, and it, it is possible. It's just that the Flames would have to be, like, as always, it would but have to be the But then you also have right... to ask, what are you willing to give up? Well, again, like, if you're basically eating a cap hit, like, that's... A significant portion of the asset cost is, hey, you now have some money, so you know, like targeting a team like Tampa, like that's what, where like that Blake Coleman talk made some sense because like they're not going to be able to re-sign him, um, and getting that type of player for the third line would pretty much be perfect for making all of that, like the the makeup of the player and. The, the role on the team so we'll see um, so I mean if we look at those top two lines right now it's Kachuk Lindholm Goudreau Monaghan you and I really have no solve at this point outside of Landis Cog for a top six winger so I think yeah, this is something via, we free, may have to do. via free, free agency we don't free agency yeah. I, I could see I could see Joel Armia being signed and put up there just because he's He's shown he's a serviceable NHLer, and he's probably better than than, than say Dubé in those roles. Um, but I think that it's it's still not the fix you want. It's the fix that might be good enough for a year. Yeah, and like how would you say? I think the Flames, based off of their moves, are still viewing themselves in like contender mode adjacent. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like if. Like, their solve for the second line is Joel Armia. I think that they're not doing a good enough job. And, you know, like, if they're getting him for the third line, great. That's that's in keeping with that player. But uh, I think that the Flames will have to either make a trade or go big game hunting. I agree. You know, one or the other. Like, if you're committing to going this route uh, that they are, you kind of have to go big or go home and uh, like th- there are no real half measures and like if they're kind of pussyfooting around and trying to finagle things in, in the oh that will do and maybe this guy might f- click uh, blah 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 no y- you need to actually bite the bullet and get the good players if you're going this route and which that's fine it's just you you have to actually pay the piper at this point. Well, without being able to solve that problem, let's move to the back end then and see what we can solve from free agency. We obviously need to replace 
uh, defenseman in Giordano and probably bring in a veteran there. I mean, if you look, Hannafin is a veteran. Tanev's a veteran, but we Anderson, still new to the league. Valimaki, Shillington, new to the league. I think we need sort of a, a grizzled veteran here. So looking at the list of free agents, who would you bring in to fill that, let's say, second pairing role with vet, with a veteran? Mm. Do you want me to toss some names out? Yeah, I think that would be... Sure. Um, let's go. I'll start at the bottom, kind of the bottom of my list here. Uh, 25-year-old Neil Pionk. That would be a good one. I, I like Pionk. Uh, I don't think that the Flames realistically need a top-pairing guy. I think that I Han- Hannafin Tanev is your top-pairing next year. Mm-hmm. And you're, at this point, needing somebody to play with Anderson on the second pairing. Uh, Pionk made three million. Oh, Pionk's an RFA, so maybe not a likely target. Let's move on to uh, UFA. Sorry. Let's. Uh, what about Sammy Vatnin? Nah, yeah, not really. I don't see him as a as a top four. No, and uh, realistically, he is not good enough defensively. Uh, I think the Flames need more of a slightly defensive, more defensively sound guy. Then would you would you look up north and bring in Tyson Berry? Uh, no, not at all. I wouldn't either. I've heard I've heard the name out there is a lot of teams being interested, but I'm not sure he's the guy we need on that second pairing. And if you look at that second pairing as pretty much the partner for um, if if Hannafin Tanev is your first pair or Anderson Tanev, then you're looking for either a partner for Hannafin or Anderson, and I don't think that would be a good fit. No. Um, Brandon Montour. Out of Florida. That would be an adequate budget option, but underwhelming. Um, do you go Eric Goodbranson? I, if the Flames needed a third-pairing guy, sure, but uh, a, a middle-pairing guy, I don't think so. I think good Branson at 29 or even Montura at 27. I'd be okay to throw those guys a one- or two-year deal as a second pair guy and see what happens. I mean, I think we've got we've got enough talent there that I think you can mask some of the, both those guys' deficiencies. True. Um, what about Jason? Uh, actually, let's go a different road. What about uh, Ryan Murray? Again, adequate but underwhelming. Would you go a little bit older and bring in for one year Matt Niskanen? I'd pass. I think he's regressed a bit and not as effective. Do you try to swing back around on Dougie Hamilton? Uh, too expensive. Uh, Alex Edler? Too old. Do you try to bring in either Yandel or Sutter on a one year or Suter on a one year deal? Suter, I would. Um, Yandel. Do you think he's your second pairing guy though? Yeah. Uh, okay. Entirely. A uh, borderline. What would you for, pay suitor? I'd go one year five or two year five. Okay. Easily, and I like he would be a borderline first pairing guy. I actually with him, I don't understand why Minnesota bought him out. I can understand buying out Parise. I don't understand uh, buying him out, but yeah. Um, another guy that I would maybe look at potentially is uh, 33-year-old Alec Martinez coming out of Vegas. He made $4 million last year. Yeah, I think that was he, the guy that was number one on my list. I think it, I wouldn't offer much more than 4 or 5 and I think I'd keep it to a one-year because I think, again, you're filling a hole for now. Yeah. And, um, and exactly, because like, you're basically, with whomever you get, you're basically hoping that Valimaki pushes them down the lineup. And yeah. you don't want to spend like five or six or seven million dollars on that guy only to have Valimaki push them them down the lineup, and then you're stuck with an anchor around your neck. So it's one of those where, yeah, if Martinez like, would be pretty much perfect with what my thought process was. Martinez would be good. I can. I, I could see Tyson Berry ending up here, even though he's not the guy I want. I could see the Flames making a run for him just because he is. I mean, he had 48 points in 56 games last year, and he's a right shot. So I can see the Flames making a run at him. I wouldn't be upset if he came here. Um, I just, he's not the guy I would be targeting. Yeah. Um, and then another guy that I think could be, uh, he's older, could be a sleeper for one year, potentially would be Goligovsky. Yeah, again, uh, probably a little long in the tooth, but not 
the worst suggestion. But if, if you're kind of looking for a one-year guy, he's 35. He made 5.4 last year. If you get him for four as your number four, I think on a one-year deal, that's not terrible. Yeah. Uh, honestly, with the free agents and that, the one player that I would be most confident in would actually be Alec, Alec Martinez, uh, just due to the familiarity with Daryl and all that. So, um, beyond that, uh, like, it, there, it's sort of like that uh, winger for Gaudreau's line. Like, there are a lot of, well, yeah, maybe kind of shoehorn it in uh, out of necessity, but is, is it the best fit? Not really. But at the same time, if we're going to go out and spend assets to get assets, I'd rather we spend assets to get assets on the forward side and try to fill this spot through UFA. True. That's my thought on this. Like, I think there's enough serviceable guys that you could find somebody. Hey, you like sure. to convert uh, defensemen to wingers. Brent, Brendan Smith can play left defense, right defense, or left wing. Maybe that's maybe that's our first uh, defenseman winger. Yeah. So I, I think there are a lot of options for number four, but I think we need some veteran presence. That's why I'm drawn to a guy like Goligovsky. I think we've got a very young core, and I think even just bringing in a guy with you know NHL experience, a lot of it, it might be more valuable at this point than um, than necessarily who the guy is, if that makes sense. Like I think if the Flames still think they're in the contender mode, you need guys like Lucic who've been there, who've been around for a while. And I think there might be some value in just bringing in some grizzled vets. Yeah, well, that's exactly why, like I was mentioning Martinez specifically, mm-hmm. because, Mar- he, you know, he won the cup and has been, you know, on good teams that have gone deep multiple times. You yeah. know, I, I, like, I think that, like, of all of the names, like, his has the most check marks beside it. I agree. Of, of what the team needs, so... My only worry with Martinez is somebody's going to throw him a six-year, five-year, six-year deal because I think he's one of the few that's really good out there, and I, I don't know why I would want to go that far. He's 33 already. I would go three years on him. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't go more than three years. No. And, like, if you're to say, like, three years, four million, um, like, if he ends up getting pushed down the lineup as, like, your third-pairing defenseman, that's still doable. Uh, you can you probably know. stomach that for the last year of that deal. Yeah. And depending on how he's doing at that point, I mean, if you need out of that deal, that's still a pretty probably movable yeah. $4 million, even in that last year. Yeah, because, like, how do you say, defensive defensemen like him tend not to completely evaporate overnight type of thing. Like, they get a little bit, bit less, but, like, the aspects of their game that um, are important they stay, it's sort of like Derek England, like he was still effective until like he was like 36, 37, so you know it's, it'll be interesting to see, I would not be upset if yeah well, let's move on to the last position to fill then, and that is the goaltending position. And we know that we have our starter in Jacob Markstrom. Markstrom is, uh, he's no question the starter for next year. I don't even think it's going to be a 1A, 1B. This is the guy. But we need somebody to be his backup. And you and I have both said it's not going to be somebody internally. So, Matt, who do you like as the backup there? Uh, my number one choice would be Laurent Boussois. Um He tends to fare well... Uh, facing fewer shots and Daryl's system is set up to allow as few of shots as possible so it's kind of a fit in terms of play style plus he's going to be cheap and he's used to playing behind a goalie that plays a lot in Hellebuck so again he, his is the name that has the most check marks beside it Brassois made 1-5 last year I don't think you can afford to pay your backup more than 2 this year yeah, I think one and a half would be perfect, and yeah, yeah, I could see, I could see Brisson there. Uh, what do you think of? I'll just throw out a couple other names here. Uh, Ilya Sorokin out of uh, New York. Oh, he's an RFA. Never mind. Uh, what What if we go someone older and we go with like a Yaroslav Halak? That'd be fine. Or a Car- Carter Hutton. Someone who's been around the uh, league, who's played starter minutes. 
Yeah. What do you think of those guys? Perfectly fine. The guy I would like to target here, but I don't know you can get him sub two, would be Linus Olmark. I like Olmark. I think like um, like Bersois, he can he can jump in at a moment's notice. He's usually pretty ready to go. I can't think of a lot of bad games for Linus Olmark where you know you can pin it on him. Um, I, I I don't mind Bersois, but I'd be more comfortable with twenty seven year old Linus Olmark. Yeah. Would you yeah. be knocking on the door, David Riddick? No. I think that ship sailed. What about Jonathan Bernier? Uh, I think that uh, he's going to be signing in Carolina after they gave up Nadelkovich for him, which was one of the most confoundingly stupid trades I've seen in a long time. I agree. But, you know, um, like when the general manager of the team that you trade the guy to says, yeah, we don't really know what they were thinking. Uh, yeah, that wasn't a good move. <laughs> so. If we, if he would fall to, uh, and I'd even pay a little bit more for this guy, but if he would fall to about 2-2-5, two, two, I would look at Peter Mrazek. Yeah, I, I would doubt it. Uh, and I think he's more wanting to uh, be the starter guy, but I would, I, if if the price was right, yeah, sure. Would you look at bringing McElhaney back at 38? No. I agree. So I think we're down to Bersois, uh, potentially Olmark, a veteran like Halak or Hutton. Um, but I think this is really just going to be a numbers game. I think they have to set a hard number on this and say who will play for that. Mm-hmm. But I think this is where you need either a career... I think you need a, a career backup or a guy like Bersois who, like you said, is used to playing behind guys who play a lot of minutes. And I think this is one thing we saw with Riddick last year. He's been trained to be a starter, and he wasn't good when he had to sit for long periods of time and then come in. So I think this is where, I mean, you look at even when you had guys like Cujo in the league being backed up by Brathwaite or, you know, guys like um, Broder being backed up by Dunham. Like, you had these backups that knew their role. Yeah, like they Craig Billington be- or, you know, insert Fitzpatrick or, you know, like there was a whole bunch of guys that were just that, you know, adequate filler guy. Matt, if we look back through NHL history, there's been a lot of these guys that were career backups to guys that played heavy minutes. You look at, you know, Brathwaite backing up Cujo. You look at Dunham backing up Brodeur. I think that's what we need to find here. We need to find that that player who, like Bressois, you were saying, is used to playing behind guys who have big minutes. They know how to come in last minute. They know how to clean up when you need them. And I think that's where... David Riddick struggled. He was a starter. We moved into a backup role, and he didn't know how to sit for a long period of time and still be ready. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Calgary doesn't really have any uh, goalies that are imminently pushing the door down to join the NHL. That's part of the reason why the Flames signed Markstrom in the first place. So it's one of those where Calgary just needs to basically punt the ball down the line a bit and until somebody steps up and like you have like say wolf coming in in like a year or two to be the backup and you know it's we'll see like it it's just a matter of time waiting and evaluating and and on and on and on if we were to start the season with zega doolin as our backup would you feel like the Flames squandered an opportunity? Yeah, pretty much. So would I. I think um, I think you need to go out and find somebody there. And I think you just got to put a hard cap on the money, right? We're willing yeah. to pay $1 million, $2 million, whatever. We won't go past this. We'll find the best guy for that money. This is not a position where you go, well, this is the guy. We'll spend a little bit more to get this guy. Yeah, it's one of those things that because the Flames are – in quasi contender mode still like you can't just you know oh that'll do for the backup goalie who's going to play a quarter of your season like it you know you have to be thorough and get players that can play period and you know because like if markstrom goes down for a month would you want uh, the zagadul and wolf pairing as your goalies like that's just not acceptable And I think that right there, what you just said, is the key, right? Is we need to bring in a backup that we feel comfortable enough that should Markstrom go down, knock on wood. 
um, that guy can step in. And I, I, I would be on the verge of that with Brassois. Um, I think at that point you'd have to go and find somebody else, either through trade or not. But I think that's the real thing is I don't feel that confident with Zagadulin in that role. Um, so I, I think you would really need to go out and, and find a, a backup who you feel comfortable somebody. with. Somebody. It say doesn't for, even need to well, be. What do you think is reasonable for a month? That you think could start for a yeah. month if, if our guy went down? Yeah, it's sort of like so what it's, uh, yeah, happened that's... when Chad Johnson took over a few years ago. Like, you just need somebody who can, you know, like, if they need to play six or seven or eight, nine, ten games in a row, you know, then go for it. And, you know, if it's a longer situation, then it, it that's a whole different problem, but, yeah. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I don't know. This is the year that I think we have a lot that we need to change, but I don't know the answers are out there to buy as free agents. We have a lot of money, like you said, but I don't know. Uh, it feels like to address the biggest issues, we are going to have to trade our way into the solution. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that way too, Matt? Yeah. Which is, I don't know. That's kind of scary too, because I'm thinking, what do we give up, and and what don't we? But I guess we'll find out. Come the 28th and into the early part of August, what this team decides to do, because all we can do is sit and wait and see. I, I have faith that Trill Living will make good moves. I don't, I, I've said this before. I think he's a good GM, um, but I, I'm, I'm just curious to see what he's going to do. Yeah. And realistically, like this team is at a spot where they can, like, especially with how the league is right now, like cat, space is at a premium and like there are only a handful of teams that have anywhere near the cap room that we do and there's a lot of more teams that are like at or over the the cap like you you take the san jose sharks for example like talk about a team that you could pillage if you know you were willing to eat some salary like you you could get quite a few good parts for not very much just to get them out of cap jail so you know and there it, are a few guys there the only thing with san jose i don't like is a lot of their bad deals are long deals yeah and if they if they were short deals there's a couple guys i could see being you know temporary fixes like i look at their deal i don't want to take on couturier's deal till 26 27 i don't want to take on kane's deal um timo mayor he's six million for two years, yeah, I could see that being a serviceable enough option for a top six winger. Yeah, and like, how would you say, like, if, uh, like, say, Couture or uh, Kane, if San Jose ate some of the contract like uh, the Coyotes did with Ekman Larson, then that makes it more palatable even with the distance. Like, if you're getting, say, Couture at the equivalent of, like, $5 million for the, the duration, like, even though it's, like, two years longer than you'd like, that's still acceptable because the cap hit... Like, even if he regresses, like, he would be, like, a $4 million forward instead of a $5 million forward, which it's like, yeah, and... To me, if we're going to take cap and try to solve our top wing problems, I would rather go for Timo Mayer, who's got six oh, million for, sure. for two more years. Or even uh, try to get Thomas Hurdle, who's on a one-year expiring deal. Oh, for sure. And I think that, like, depending on the makeup of the trade, like, you could, like, oh, we'll take the older guy and you throw in the good younger guy. It's sort of like the, to use the exact comparison, the ekman Larson trade. Like, uh, they uh, gave up ekman Larson, but also uh, Connor Garland, who is a good middle six player. And they had to include Garland just to make the deal work. And I think if Calgary went that route, like, if they had to eat Couture, say then, you know, you could ask for Meyer or uh, Hurdle or whomever, LeBanc, for uh, it to be in the deal as well, and that you would be then effectively killing two birds with one stone, getting the third line guy as well. So, 
Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what Tree ends up doing. Yeah, like there, are, there are a lot of permutations out there. If and how and all of that. Well, Matt, I think that's about it for this week. We've talked about the draft. The Flames are just moments away from making their third round selection as we record, but I think uh, people can look that and the subsequent rounds up themselves. And we will talk to everyone early in August once we start to figure out what Tree does to try and solve our problems. Yep, and it'll be interesting to see if, you know, because if the Flames are realistically going into uh like re go into contender mode like they have enough cap space where if they actually get two legit top nine forwards and a top four defenseman like this team could still be a scary team to play and possibly a an actual team that might be able to do something but you know we have to see exactly what happens I like your idea that this team might, uh, you know, this team might go out and solve their problem by eating somebody else's cap issue, and I think that's probably, if we're looking to trade, the most realistic way of of acquiring those players at the level we need them to be. Yeah, because we don't really need a superstar. Like the four guys that we have with Monahan, Gaudreau, Lindholm, and Kachuk, like that's your core group. We need f- guys to accentuate and surround those guys with and we just have to wait and see well let's wait and see and we'll talk to everyone once we see what this team does and as always go flames go and edmonton what are you doing fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.